Yeah, so while everyone's getting comfortable, we're going to move on to our next session, which is a fireside chat with Matt Monaghan, Chief Technology Officer at um, Arc XP. It's human versus AI. Who's the most original? So hopefully Matt's air, airplane has landed and he's in his. There he is. <laughs> I didn't recognize you. I've seen you. In, yeah. Brilliant. Take, it, take a pew and. Um, Perfect. I'll just get a glass of water and then uh, we'll let people sit down. Yeah, no problem. Right, brilliant. Listen, welcome, Matt. Hey uh, your, I think your colleagues. Is she still in the air? Is she, is she, she landed as well. You have the flight she's too. Landed as well. Yeah, I brilliant. She's here someplace. Brilliant. Yeah. Um, so, um, Arc XP, Jeff Bezos backed uh, SaaS publishing technology company, um, developed in house at the Washington Post. Um, you now provide the platform for more than two thousand sites around the world. Uh, some of them have a bigger audience even than the um, the Post itself. Uh, and just for, so people understand it, so you're a digital experience platform and a content management system. Uh, yeah, that's right. Uh, look for, which mainly larger, larger publishers, is that fair? Yeah, that's true. I mean, we, you know, for us, um, we're focused on both media and non-media, but you know, obviously our legacy is in the media space. We run, again, something like 2,000 sites around the world. A lot of scaled media organizations. Um, doesn't mean only the biggest ones in each country, but we certainly do a good job with those types of customers. Also, um, you know, customers that are running many, many different websites side by side, including smaller ones. Um, but definitely our heritage is the media. We understand the space very well. That's where we came from, and, you know, we're very enthusiastic about it. Oh, brilliant. And uh, just so that I can understand um, what, what it is you guys do, what, what is it that makes you slightly different from, say, other, like WordPress or something I don't know? You, you've yeah, got, sure. You've, got lot, you've grown very quickly. So what's the, what's the key sort of differentiator there, which is... Sure, yeah. So, I mean, I'm, you know, coming from the Washington Post, we also had experience with WordPress. I know, you know, our competitive side very well, and there's a lot of good solutions on the market. It's a crowded space. Um, for us, number one, we're especially focused on, on media. Um, again, we understand the space really well. And we understand the need of creating a lot of content at high volume, high pace. You know, the needs of sort of media publishers particularly aligns with that problem. And we have a lot of really good solutions for that type of thing. We also provide a, a pretty broad solution set. So... Um, to the extent that our customers are also focused on things like digital video production, live video, um, digital subscription management, which John just talked about, we provide a, a suite that serves all of those needs. And the final piece is we run it as a software as a service solution. Um, so I think our big value proposition, especially for media customers, is that instead of having to focus on sort of the nuts and bolts of running software within your engineering and IT teams, you can kind of get on with focusing on your audience. And that's what's most important to us for our customers is letting them focus on their audience. It's a challenging time, obviously, growing digital subscriptions, our affiliate revenue, as John talked about, and we want to enable our customers to, to focus 100% of their energy on that rather than sort of you know, running the plumbing. Brilliant. So look, listen, we're going to, um, the topic of our chat is, a, is, is around uh, generative AI, chat GPT. We had, we had an interesting discussion um, in the run-up to this. And I thought it would be a useful scene setter, if you don't mind, for the, for the whole conference today. Just to give us a little bit your view on well, uh, how it works, basically. Because yeah. uh, I'm not sure if we all totally understand that. And what it can and can't do. Because I think uh, the, you were interested in talking about the limitations of it and also the strengths of it. Yeah, exactly. Well, first, I was you know, enthused to see kind of both um, John's points on the topic as well as kind of the, you know, the questions in the room about it. The answer to the... So the question posed in the, in the headline to this is, you know, right now humans are obviously more original. Um, and it is, it's a very simple thing, I think, at the beginning. It's what we're talking about really isn't AI like artificial intelligence. It's, it's a subset. It's called language models, large language models. And it's basically a predictive model for creating language. So, you know, I think sometimes the abstract questions that people pose, is AI going to you know, replace writers? Is it going to somehow just automate the job of journalism? You know, those questions, they're, they're fun to ask, and at some point, maybe some of those questions will actually become more practical. Um, at the moment, you know, I think the way John framed it, you know, around kind of experiments and productivity enhancements is mostly what we're seeing right now, too. 
But I do think, you know, for publishers, we need to ask ourselves the question of what's our value chain? Because there's a lot of times in a room like this, I'll ask, you know, media publishers, what do you do? And the answer they'll say is, well, we write stories, you know? If that's the answer to that question, then maybe there is a little bit of a problem because large language models can do a decent job of writing stories with human input, with editing, of course. Um, what's more important is, you know, what's the primary source content? What are you doing that's actually original? The example of, you know, pressing on a mattress to see how good it is, creating live sports content, doing original reporting. AI still can't have deeply sourced, uh, you know, information coming from the home office. They obviously don't have exclusive rights to live sporting events. You know, so there's a lot of things that, that media companies can do that is original um, and then take advantage of AI for automating some of the more mundane tasks. And, and hopefully that kind of answers the question. And so, yeah, and I think what the, key, the key interesting thing for me was to hone, maybe to hone in on this fact, the idea of this, that a large language model uh, isn't necessarily involved in the world of fact uh, and evidence in the way that we are. So we, a lot of us are publishers are around facts and evidence reporting. Whereas a large language model doesn't quite see the world like that, is that right? Yeah, exactly. I think what people refer to as hallucinations is almost sort of, um, perhaps people are kind of fooled by the fact that it can create pretty conversational content, but really all it's doing is predicting language. And because the training set does contain facts and information, it can sometimes cough up the right information too. Um, it understands the import of questions that you ask it, so it can sort of predict sometimes um, the correct answer, but that's not its intent. It really is just creating language, which isn't to say that there aren't, you know, both researchers and, you know, commercial organizations today focused on sort of marrying up the gap between language models and graph databases. I do see, you know, like that, that merger will happen over time. So, you know, that, the limitations that exist with language models today won't be the fundamental limitation forever, but it is what's true today. Okay. So um, if anyone's got any questions, uh, please pose them on Slido. I've worked out how to use it. It's just here, so it's all good. Um, or, we, or, we, or we can do it the old-fashioned way at the end. Um, I, I guess one of the, one of the useful things um, I think people can get from a conference like this is some examples of, you know, um, of things going on in the wild, you know, in action. So, I mean, can you share any, share the sort of things that you guys are doing with Gen AI at ArcXP and the sort of things that your, uh, the publishers you work with are, d are doing and, and, and how, how, you're, how you're making use of it. For sure, I can give examples of both. So, um, what John called productivity enhancements, I think is exactly right. Um, we have a number of different tools that we're building inside of our suite or integrated with our existing tools to make, to make publishers, to make the job of reporters and producers and, and others simpler and easier to do. Um, and so there's obviously the consumer side of it, which is you know, summarization and things like that, but we can do things, for instance, like suggesting multiple different headlines or um, different bits of copy, and we can test those against each other, you know, which can include a test against human written copy or copy that's created by the machine. Um, there's also cases, I, I would add a kind of category to sort of experiments and productivity enhancements. The final one I would say is sort of like what today are impossible scenarios for a lot of media publishers. Um, things like mass translation of content is something that I've seen a number of our customers doing. They want to access new markets. Um, there's still obviously the fact that you need to be reviewing and editing that content in the end. But previously, it was pretty difficult to have high quality translations of content. And actually, one thing that some specific subset of the LLMs are getting pretty good at is translating and you know, quality translations. So it doesn't eliminate the need for you know, human review of that content and editing it finally. But you can do a lot of that much faster than you used to in the past. And so we have a, a handful of customers that are um, translating at scale, getting access to new markets. And they, I think they use it as a way to sort of decide where they're going to double down in the future. Yeah, that's interesting. I think that's something that everyone's probably looked at over the years and, and probably thought, nah, it's just not good enough. But you feel it's kind of it's, it, it's there now in the sense that you, you, you can do this now at scale. And, what, and how would that work? Do people, you, would you say that, um, say, people that, from China come onto your website and see a sort of Chinese language version, or how do you do it? Yeah, so um, I don't know if that's us or... Um, yeah, so, you know, I think it's, it's basically, the quality is getting pretty good. It's not perfect. It still requires humans to review it. Um, but it is possible to create relative high-quality translations of content. And then um, what we see is publishers doing it in markets that aren't core to them today, where they want to see if they have an opportunity to sort of gain share of voice. Uh, and I, I think the overall strategy probably means that if that's successful, 
they then plan on doubling down in those markets with additional hiring and additional staffing. Okay. So I think um, you know a lot of publishers, um, probably most publishers, uh, major publishers this year probably set up a little working group on generative AI. Yeah. They've probably got like a Slack channel or something or, or, or a WhatsApp group. Um, and, and they're, they're, they're all thinking hard about what, you know, how we can use this. It feels like it's, uh, you know, it's, it's not like uh, the next kind of uh, metaverse or NFT. It feels like it's a, lot more, it's a lot more fundamental than that. And I'm just wondering what um, advice you would give to a publisher who's maybe starting on their journey with this and, and how, they can, how they can harness it and how they can make use of it. Yeah, so I mean, I guess I would distinguish between, um, I mean, it's, it's definitely a practical technology, which maybe differs it from previous technology hype cycles. It definitely still is in the hype cycle. And the types of questions that, you know, I think folks pose about it is reflective of that fact. Um, I would sort of distinguish between the concern about whether publishers share their content with large public models. So the point about, you know, should you allow things like OpenAI to train based on your content? That one's a pretty easy answer, probably not. Um, Google, like John mentioned, is a lot more challenging because, you know, one, because they crawl your content for search as well as for training their model. It's also more challenging because their infrastructure is inherently set up to do it much faster. And so I think there's something unique about Google with that, that if they close the gap on having their models, um, you know, sort of start to, uh, assimilate more of the factual information, do more than just summarization, it will be a real challenge for the industry. Um, so I do think there's a part of, you know, every publisher business that's out there that needs to be forming a point of view about how they sort of work with these public models. But that's just one problem set. You know, the other thing that's happening is it's a pretty transformative technology. I think even today, not for the whole world, not yet, it's not that type of AI, but it is for a room full of people where a lot of our companies employ people who write content for a living. And I think that's, you know, the calling it productivity enhancement maybe undersells it a little bit because even today, you know, things like copywriting, for instance, or copywriting, copy editing, for instance, um, there's a lot that these models are capable of doing, uh, doing today. You know, and that doesn't mean creating original content, that doesn't mean editing, um, but we all employ people who do those tasks today. So it is something that people need to be considering right now. And so I think to the question of what should companies be doing to be preparing for it, you need a real strategy around that. You know, the, the question of do we send our content to open AI or not, I mean, there's, there's both tactics and strategy around that, but internally, companies need to develop a, a core competency around understanding this technology and being prepared for it. And so one of the things that, you know, ArcXP, we try to make simple is, to the extent that companies are experimenting with language models, with Gen AI, we want to make it easy to sort of build those experiments and incorporate them into your existing content, into your existing site, um, knowing that most of us are working with relatively small teams, you know, and there's still experiments at this phase. Okay, and just on the oh, oh here we go, yeah, just on that point about um, whether um, to allow ChatGPT to scrape uh, your content. You said that would be a, a, a no as far as you're concerned. Why, just why? Why is that? Well, I think I mean maybe there's a little bit of history here for a lot of publishers, but you know, I think rushing into that, giving content away for free to basically train these models for free, they need that content to create higher quality models in the future for the training set. And you know, there's few other organizations in the world other than the media companies that are producing content en masse that those models need. And you know, whether or not you allow OpenAI to train from your content is totally separate from the question of whether you can use LLMs in your business to help you be more productive or to experiment with new things for your audience. Right now, there's a number of companies working on um, commercializing basically private LLMs. You can do it today. And so you could take public models and you can augment them, you can fine tune them. And that's the type of thing that publishers need to be focused much more on. Because you don't need to give your content away for free to take advantage of having a fine tuned, trained model using your content to help you kind of automate some of the tasks inside your organizations. And, and you don't need to give up your IP to do that. How do you? Um, oh, I've got some questions coming in. So, um, any more? Any more? Any more questions? File away, and we'll leave, we'll leave some time for it. Um, as far as you can tell, and, and I know we've, you know, it's very hard to crystal ball gaze. Uh, you know, a year ago, who who would have predicted what we'd be talking about today? But how how do you see um, the relationship between uh, the the reporters and the and uh, human staff and the AI developing? Um, 
in, a kind of, in publishers as we go forward. What, what, what sort of tasks do you, do you see uh, being more uh, used by AI and what, what tasks do you see um, the, the humans kind of being better to focus their time on yeah. to sort of develop? I think it mostly comes down to, to kind of primary source content. There needs to be something of original value in the content you create. To the extent that, you know, we have people creating content that might be like hot takes on a tweet, that's going to be the first type of content that will be more easily automated. You know, if it isn't exactly possible today, eventually the language models will get there. Um, creating originally sourced content, live content, primary source content like video and photo, those are things that can't be replaced and they have inherent value you know, for readers and for audience. So, so I think there's a little bit of like unpacking the value chain for publishers to do where you think about what is it that your organization really does and what has unique value and that's where people should be focusing on. Um, because I do think the actual task of creating written content will likely get cheaper over time. There's one other point to make about that which is that I do think over time LLMs will probably transform the way that users consume content. And that, I think, is an important point. It's not just about sort of creating a summary and obviously what Google's doing to try to get your content onto their platform. Um, I do think over time, today we all live in a world where you create one piece of content for everybody. And one of the things that, you know, it starts with something simple like translations and for different segments of your audience. Over time, I see that changing, where LLMs will allow us to create personalized and highly segmented content for, for your audience. Um, it'll still depend on original information. And it'll still depend on kind of originally sourced content that your teams create. But I don't think there'll be that fundamental limitation of one piece of content for the entire audience. And that'll probably change things pretty dramatically, too. OK. I've got some uh, good questions coming through here. So. Um uh, this might be a quick one for you. I don't know whether you, I don't know whether you're well placed to answer this or not, though. But do you think AI scrapes content uh, behind paywalls? Do I think AI scrapes content behind paywalls? I mean, yeah. I mean, I would say that in general, like the scraping, um, the scrapers that are out there do their best to try to grab content from wherever they can. Um, having a high quality paywall is important for that. Um, and it's also true that if your content gets shared or syndicated in any way, there's multiple different paths to incorporating that content into models. How do you see um, um, uh, video developing for um, press companies now? Um, do you see that as an important way for publishers to boost traffic and get digital subscriptions? So uh, we've talked about social video a lot, uh, but mm -hmm. I guess it's, this might be more uh, publisher video on their sites. Yeah, I'm really bullish on video overall for publishers because, again, it's, it's original primary source content. It's very, very difficult to replace. The challenge is there's no quick path to it. Um, there's obviously companies out there that do do automatically created video based on other input content. Um, but I think the most valuable content is going to be that primary source original content. And so the challenging part about that is you know, your teams may or may not have people on staff already who know how to create that content. There's a lot of training involved. But I do think it's worth you know, it's worth kind of the price of admission. And it's worth being a little bit experimental and creative about how you get that content at first. You know, to the extent that you're working for a media company that has people out in the field doing reporting, you have the opportunity to create primary source content there. Um, and so there's challenges, obviously, with making sure people have the right training and right assumptions about their jobs. But I do think it's worth overcoming that hurdle. One of the things we do at ArcXP is we have great software for publishers who are getting started with video. You know, it's kind of the whole suite from VOD to live and video playback on the site. And so we can make the technology part of it pretty turnkey, but you do need to figure out what content creation looks like to be in playing in that space. OK. Uh, question here. Any, any, more, any more examples you can give of publishers already doing good things with generative AI? Yeah, sure. So I gave the example of translations already. Um, but beyond that, I've seen a lot of good work around testing of copy. Uh, and by the way, it doesn't just have to be, you know, we're so focused on sort of the content side of it. I've seen a bunch of examples of publishers who are using Gen AI to create copy for their marketing pages, you know, for like digital subscriptions, campaigns, calls to action, things like that. And what you can do with that is you can create many, many, many different pieces of copy and content for those marketing pages, test them side by side at a scale that frankly is pretty difficult to do, you know, with human marketers. Um, so I've seen that example play out. Um, a lot of good experiments with private LLMs happening among our customers today that we're happy to help facilitate. So that's something that, you know, if anyone's interested in talking more about, I'm happy to speak to. Okay. So that's where you license the technology uh, to look at your own 
your own site? Did you say a lot of license that element? Yeah, well, we, we make it very simple to sort of um, to get your content to some of these platforms, uh, like private LLMs, to be able to augment the content and the metadata. Basically, we want to make it as easy as possible for publishers to develop a strategy to be experimenting in this space, to do it quickly without having to invest a lot of work in the plumbing to make it happen. Okay. Uh, we've, got to, we've got time for uh, <clears throat> one last question here. Uh, so this is, with courts ruling that AI-generated content can't be copyrighted, um, is AI a trend that will just disappear? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think there's... That's going to be true for completely AI-generated content, at least today. That doesn't mean that you're not using it as a tool to make the job of creating content easier. You know, and so at some point, whether it's, you know, at least some of it's created by AI, whether it's created by a human, if you're editing and publishing it, you know, through your organization with a human in the end, then I think we're still safe for now. Brilliant. Uh, thank you so much, Matt Monhan from ARC XP. Thanks for joining Thanks. us. Thanks. Thank you.